In this episode, I'm joined by Mary Shutan, author, occultist, and spiritual teacher. Mary shares her journey from a traumatic early childhood to adoption into an upper middle class family and how spiritual overwhelm in her teenage years and a subsequent kundalini awakening drove her to in-depth study of spiritual themes. Mary details her own kundalini experience, including challenging side effects, kundalini traps, and the role of sacrifice on the spiritual path. Mary also discusses her love of reading and magical realism, recounts her time as a ritual magician working with the dark feminine, advises on encounters with entities and extraterrestrials, and describes the different types of spiritual protection employed by institutions and public figures. So without further ado, Mary Shutan. Mary Shutan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm very delighted to be talking with you today. And as I was reviewing your uh, website and reviewing your various uh, published output, you've written a lot of books. I I counted seven. Is that right? I actually just came out with my eighth last month. Yeah. So I I have written a lot. What's the eighth one? I may have missed that on the site. It is um, the Shamanic Workbook 3. So um, I've been going through a process of taking some of my prior teachings and courses I've, I've taught over the years um, and turning them into a form that can be digested and um, read through by people interested in, in shamanic work. So um, that would be my latest. Very cool. And I'm curious, actually, having written so many books, do you have a sort of process or how, how do you approach writing a book? You've written, a, a, of course, quite a wide range of subjects, and we're going to get into the specifics a bit later. But I'm curious if you have any kind of writing process. Uh, my writing process. <laughs> um, My process has typically been going through an intense period of seeking my own education for for basically my own purposes. And then that intense period of time of research um, of whatever I'm interested in, out of that comes a book eventually. Um, And so a lot of my books are things that um, I wish I could have had much earlier in my path. Okay, yeah, well, we're going to find out a bit about that process of journey and self-exploration. But I'm curious to begin with, if I could ask a bit about your upbringing. You've written, I grew up in the upper middle class world of the Midwest of the USA in a family of intellectuals who fostered my love of reading. I became obsessed with mythology, fairy tales, the supernatural, magical realism, and the experiences of those who'd been othered by society at an early age. You've also described growing up in a household of fear and violence. That's a quote. And you've written to say one more, perhaps uh, give one more quote about it. I grew up knowing that there was something distinctly other about me. In many ways, I was a typical child. I had friends, did well on my schoolwork when I cared to put effort into it. I went through many of the typical initiations of childhood and adolescence. But in other ways, I grew up fearing that something was deeply wrong with me or that people would find out that there was something wrong with me. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little about your upbringing, your early life, the context of that period of time. Sure. Um, well, I was adopted at age two and a half. And so I was um, born to a 16-year-old mother um, who couldn't care for me properly. And so she put me up for adoption and I was adopted by a family of um, upper middle class intellectuals. My father was a lawyer. My mother was a teacher specifically of Shakespeare and British literature at a high school level for a long period of time. And so my upbringing was very much going to plays that I didn't want to go see that I had no interest in and listening to classical music that I didn't, you know, (laughs) want to hear on car rides and, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, But what I would say is that, um, my parents really fostered a love for me um, in me for reading and they really, I have all of these just lovely memories of my mother taking me to the library pretty much every Sunday and I would just go in and find whatever I was interested in. And so they were always willing to support um, whatever weird interests that I had from, you know, mythology to, you know, when I would later get pocket money, you know, occultism and tarot cards and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. 
and this context of fear and violence that you've you've talked about you know a lot of your journey as we'll discover uh, in fact you brought it up has been uh, from necessity a lot of your education has been out of necessity H having uh, significant experiences of various kinds a kundalini awakening which i'd like to ask you about near death experiences and all sorts of things um high high sensitivity etc working with trauma and these sorts of uh backgrounds have propelled your study it seems and uh been the fuel in a way for, for, for a lot of your learning so i'm curious if we might set a bit of that context in terms of your upbringing uh fear and violence and so on i mean can you say something about um uh should we say you've talked also about childhood trauma so can you set something of a context there to contextualize what happens next Sure. Uh, what I will say is that my time pre-adoption was um, primarily the fear, violence, neglect um, sort of picture of things. And as anyone who works with trauma knows, that period of time until year, year two is a very important time for stabilizing kind of what you think of the world, what you think of yourself. Do you feel safe on a basic level or not? Um, and the, the starting of really... Um, figuring out, hey, is this a place that I want to be in or not? Um, and so there was a lot to work through for me, um, not only um, for that time previous to when I was two and a half, um, but also in terms of my work, we also look for ancestral and family lineage patterns. So I had those to work through with my adoptive family as well as um, my birth family. So um, my adoptive family or my family from, from this point forward uh, are extraordinarily lovely people, but they are intellectuals and they are not particularly um, emotionally deep people. Um, and so I got adopted into a family in which emotions were not talked about, in which um, deep feelings weren't explored. It was, you know, how is school today? Uh, what are you learning? That sort of environment. And again, on a surface level, it was, it was incredibly lovely. And my family are incredible people. They just don't have the emotional depth that I do or the sensitivity that I do. And it took me a long time to figure out that um, how sensitive I was what I was sensing, what I was seeing. And so you're right, a lot of my work has been figured out, um, <clears throat> has been about sort of figuring out what is going on with me. And not only that, I had a fascination with the mechanics of it. Okay, I'm seeing or sensing something. Let's break this down. How does this actually make sense in some sort of way? Um, I tend to be a very pragmatic person. And so how does this make sense step by step? And that really has been a fuel for me as well has, as has allowed a lot of clarity personally, um, as well as has fostered a, a, a lot of books. Very interesting. And you write, in my teenage years, I began to experience increasing dreams and visions, including shamanic dismemberment dreams as well as initiatory spiritual experiences that opened me up further to the other. And elsewhere you write, um, when I was a teenager and in much of college, I numbed my sensitivities through varying substances. And so the experience of significant dreams and other spiritual happenings that were beginning to emerge more readily were drowned out. It was at this time that my sensitivities began increasing. I can now look at this period and see how unskilled I was as someone who is sensitive and how my own internal teenage chaos was magnified by my sponge-like nature, which took on the experiences and energies of my classmates. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that arc. Uh, in your teenage years, things start opening up, and then how you navigated that into college. Yeah, um, when I was a teenager, things really did start to open up, and I had always been sensitive but I started experiencing a great deal of overwhelm going to middle school and high school, for example. Um, I couldn't figure out why I was so incredibly tired at the end of the day. Um, and I look back and I can see that I was overwhelmed because I was not only going through my own teenageness, 
I was also <clears throat> absorbing all of the energies of others and attempting to process them through my own body. Um, and anybody who knows a bit about this knows that that is something that is going to easily burn you out or cause for you to be exhausted. Um, and so that was largely my experience of being a teenager um, and when I was a teenager, we moved and my parents have always lived in suburbia. So there's always been this sense of, I know that my brain works and the way that I perceive things is much different than the people around me, you know, especially in the Midwest, but I'm not exactly sure how, because I didn't have the, you know, consciousness or education to be able to really sense what was going on. And so for many years, I just thought it was imagination or strange dreams, even if they were, you know, dreams of be, being ripped apart by the elements or spiritual teachers coming to me and, and that sort of stuff. I just kind of chalked it up to, oh, you know, Mary's an artist, she's a writer, of course, she's going to get inspiration and, and that sort of stuff. It wasn't really into uh, until I got in my early 20s that I started to sense and meet other people who were um, sensitive like I was or who were interested in, in some of the things that I was kind of on a, on a deeper level. Um, so when I went off to college, I was very much focused on college. Um, but my sensitivities were still there and I was needing to do things like room with somebody in a, you know, 200 square foot room or room with, you know, eight other people later, <laughs> you know, in, in a house. And um, again, I didn't have the awareness at that age of what was going on. I just knew that I was very overstimulated. And so at that age, um, I don't think it was an entirely atypical of the college experience, but I did start a process of drinking and smoking pot and, and doing stuff like that, which um, definitely dampens energetic experiences and it, and it did for me. Very interesting. I'm curious what you studied at college. My undergrad was in English and publishing. Um, I always knew that I was going to be a writer. I thought I was going to be a fiction writer. Um, <laughs> that kind of <laughs> drastically turned. Maybe that will be my, my next shift. But um, yeah, from a young age, I was interested in being a poet and a, and a writer. And um, you said undergrad. So I, I'm presuming you did a master's or, an, or a PhD also or? I did a master's degree. My, ma my master's degree was in uh, Chinese medicine, so uh, acupuncture and herbal medicine. Who were your writing influences at that time or growing up? Who were the sorts of people you were reading that you thought, yeah, this is, this is it? You know, the first book that really, really spoke to me was House of the Spirits by Isabel Allende. Um, the magical, and then I started from there to delve into magical realism. Um, but that book was completely a revelation to me because here is the juxtaposition of everyday life with magic and mermaids and the stories of, you know, sea captains and, you know, all of this sort of stuff. Um, up until that time, I had read, you know, myths. And to some degree, you think of that as being other, as being separate from, from you. And so it was just such a revelation for me to read stories where magic was entwined with everyday life. They weren't these separate things. They were, they were very much lived and experienced together. Do you think you'll write some fiction? I do think I, I, I will. Um, my, the way that, my brain and intuition kind of set things up is that I already know the next couple of books that I am going to write um, and those are nonfiction. Um, and after that, um, I have a feeling that I will probably shift back to fiction and, and poetry, but there still are a couple of books that uh, feel the need to, to get out of my system in terms of the nonfiction realms. <laughs> Oh, that, that's very cool. Do you have a story kind of brewing in the back there uh, that you're going to get to 
or is it more a sense of a potential potential stories to be tapped into? You know, about five years ago, I did write a book, and looking back on it, it very much um, isn't anything I want to publish. <laughs> <laughs> so it was good to kind of get those gears going again because writing nonfiction and writing fiction, um, they're both writing, but they are, are so different, you know, in order to encapsulate a thought in a poem, for example, that is so much different than the exposition that's required in, in fiction or narrative. Um, and that's incredibly different than the clarity that nonfiction um, and the sort of direct nature um, that nonfiction needs to have. So it very much is a switching of gears, even if it's in the in the same sort of realm. You know, I hear so often stories you're talking about is uh, Isabel Allende and uh, magical realism and things of that nature. I hear I hear that often actually uh, in these interviews. Somebody re reads a fiction book of some sort. Um, you know, what's the other one? Like uh, Mists of Avalon is one. You know, these sort of things. I hear that yeah. sort of thing. And uh, that somehow captures the imagination in, in a childhood way, which seems to be less, child's mind seems less categorized in terms of fiction and nonfiction and can sort of launch things. So it's interesting. I wonder, I think if you write some sort of fiction um, in this sort of genre, I think it could serve that purpose for people. What do you think? I definitely think that there are some great fiction writers out there, um, like, the Club Dumas um, and stories that are similar to that, um, that very much bring in spiritual truths and spiritual stories in a way that isn't, um, you know, that isn't condescending or isn't preaching, isn't, you know, necessarily even teaching, um, but really offers in-depth spiritual insight in a way that nonfiction would be hard to get into nonfiction. Um, so yes, I very much have gained spiritual insights from fiction or had something sort of click in my head that um, from reading nonfiction and especially poetry and um, and that experience for me has just been as revelatory as, as reading, you know, um, some, you know, ancient tome of Greek, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, of Greek magic or, you know, whatever I was reading at the time. <laughs> of course, even the most, or except for the most uh, technical nonfiction, m most nonfiction has story, biography, anecdote, to illustrate its its points and of course your book has plenty of your books have plenty of that often from your own life as we've as we've pointed out um i'm curious in in terms of that fiction maybe this is a bit of a sideline but you mentioned club dumas can you what what sort of books come to mind that you think oh th these guys get the kundalini right or these 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 this book really has kabbalah well well contextualized not as you say as a teaching textbook but uh, you know, done done well. One one often thinks of, I don't know, maybe not, maybe one doesn't, but I do. <laughs> you know, those sorts of uh, spy books and uh, special forces soldiers books, etc. And very often they're full of accurate military detail. Uh, you know, it, it, along with saving the world. And um, anyway, so I'm curious if uh, you you can think of any nonfiction, uh, sorry, rather fiction books that you think actually are given quite clear and accurate examples of some of the, the themes that you write about? You know, uh, there is a book that is incredibly hard to find. I, I think it's out now in one of those, you know, because it's out of copyright law now, so anybody can publish it, but called Pan's Garden, I believe it's by Algernon Blackwood. So kind of an obscure writer, but his way in that book of writing about elements and elementals is the most profound and accurate um, depiction of what it really feels like to be with snow, to really be in a forest, you know, um, that book is, you know, has kind of a prize and place on my bookshelf because he is somebody that totally and completely gets it. Um, and there is an element to hor of horror to his stories. And I do find in the, what we would call horror realm, that there is um, a lot of, um, a lot of the other, 
Um, so Clive Barker's works, if we're going to talk about more po popular works, um, that definitely is, he's definitely somebody who, who gets it and gets, um, um, and so I would also include in that, you know, if we're going to make an all encompassing discussion is that when looking at paintings and listening to music, you can hear that sort of flow, that sort of person who is in that space of creativity, of, of magic, really, um, who, who really gets it, and who really has direct embodied experience um, of, of, what they're, of what they're speaking about, of, of what they're painting, of what they're singing. Are particular paintings or, or songs coming to mind, artists? Behind me is a Van Gogh, which is one of my favorite prints. I don't know if it could be seen too well, but um, I, I love obviously Van Gogh. Um, uh, I really lately, I'll mention him because I'm going to go to a show, but uh, Nick Cave um, is definitely somebody who gets gets things on a very deep level, but it can my musical tastes and artistic tastes very much have to do with mood. And so they can go from surrealists to, um, to people who are incredibly technical. Um, so, uh, you know, it might be even saying, you know, Frida Kahlo, um, I will stop there, but um, I will say in general that there are, um, Elliot Smith is another one that, but what you find is that um, books and lit literature and paintings and music, they often have a particular type of flow where they, you know, you can get a sense that they get it, but there's also a specific current, I'm going to use my lingo, um, where they're emanating some particular quality or some particular mood um, that is unlike somebody else who also might kind of be in be in that same sort of flow or, or that same sort of state of being. So um, so I can mention Nick Cave. I can also mention, you know, Mozart, <laughs> you know, and when you look at them, they're, they couldn't be more different in some ways, but in other ways, they're both emanating, you know, kind of the pure purity of flow that I love to hear. Mm, very interesting. Thank you for sharing some of your <laughs> artistic and uh, fictional enjoyments. You've begun uh, this unfolding in your teens and you're traversing your way through college and you write, I began doing things intuitively as if directed by an inner force that I could not consciously process. I began a daily meditation practice and became increasingly guided to books, workshops, courses, and teachers. And then you write at age 23, I began to experience full-blown manifestations of kundalini awakening that I could no longer ignore. And for the next decade of my life, I did little else beyond educate myself and attend to the unfolding of my inner spiritual nature. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. You've written a couple of books actually about kundalini, one of them working with kundalini, the other one involving kundalini in the awakening process. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about that period. What, what uh, triggered this sort of beginning to become more guided intuitively in this way and what, what's the story of the kundalini awakening you know as i as we've talked about i've always been kind of a sensitive person i've also been you know i would say a, a spiritually aware person i lived in minnesota for part of my childhood and so i have a lot of experiences of going out into nature where nobody else was around except for me and you know the deer and um, experiences sitting there and just feeling completely supported and completely held and going into spaces of of stillness and joy and so I have all these lovely experiences that I had um, as a child I had um, more difficult experiences as a as a teenager I mentioned kind of you know strange dreams and, and that sort of stuff and some of them weren't entirely pleasant but when I started to get to the period where I graduated um, from undergrad um, what happened was that I started to go into a traditional career um, it was at first retail and, and bartending and and that sort of stuff just right out of college and 
it feel felt like all of a sudden I would be doing things that were outside of what that trajectory naturally was. So I would get a pamphlet for Chinese medicine school. All of a sudden I felt such strong inner urgings to do things and they would come up again and again and they would just feel so right to me. And so I would find that if I would follow along with them that um, things would just naturally unfold for me in a way that was um, incredible. Um, I had so much energy and <laughs> during those 10 years, you know, I went through four years of Chinese medicine school, massage therapist, I have a whole list of degrees and certifications and, you know, in body work and, and, and that's energy work and, and all of that. And it was really because I was feeling Kundalini, I was feeling this force flow through me that was directing me, that was um, guiding me to a place in my life um, where I really was supposed to be. I'm wondering, you might disambiguate a little bit this word Kundalini. Of course, it's a word that's used in different contexts, different uh, traditions, I suppose, and systems, and even different authors and, and teachers discuss it sometimes really rather differently. So I'm curious if you could perhaps give us a sense of how it is you're using the word and how it is you experience that phenomenon. Yeah. Um... The problem with discussing a, a word like Kundalini is that it does have many different facets and we're talking about a spiritual word that in many ways is ineffable, but in simpler terms, um, Kundalini is consciousness and Kundalini awakening is um, the force flow of consciousness through the body. That is how I would define those terms. Um, I also love to talk about Kundalini as being creativity and the creative impulse because it very much is is tied to is very much tied to that so um typically people who are going through kundalini awakenings will experience things like shaking and shuddering through their system particularly their central column basically their spine um, because kundalini um, is basically a large ball of energy that is held within um, the cup of our sacrum. Our, our sacrum and our spine very much curve and um, uh, our, an our an an anatomical structure supports our energetic structure. And so um, Kundalini is basically a latent energy that is held within the sacrum. And for some people, it awakens for a short period of time some people it remains latent and for some people kind of the full ball of energy awakens and you write about that time during this decade of my life i experienced a wide range of changes and symptoms but the most difficult ones were primarily physical my digestive system got to the point where i could eat only rice and avocados for six months to a year at a time i experienced a small tightening of the paraspinal muscles the muscles next to the spine as well as electrical sensations in my spine continually. So I'm curious about that. How was it that you eventually were able to regulate those symptoms? In your books, you've particularly uh, working with Kundalini, for example, you write quite comprehensively about all the various um, symptoms that people can experience uh, in this process. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious uh, how you navigated that and, and what you found to regulate that process. What I found was that at the beginning, I was somebody who had studied a bit of meditation, a bit about chakras, a bit about, you know, yoga, a bit about these things, you know, kind of like any teenager who is going through that phase would. Um, but when my Kundalini awakening started I had an enormous amount of fear and resistance to the process because I was um, and I, I know that a lot of people go through that as well but when you are experiencing something so strange and you know kind of atypical of, of what we would consider kind of normal society um, 
there was a lot of resistance um, to it and to a lot of the the changes that were um, that I was experiencing in my life. Um, I also didn't understand what was going on, and so um, I started to research and educate myself um, on what was going on with me. Eventually I found a forum that is now defunct, but that was a big part of my process was actually finding people who would tell me, you know, to not meditate on my bed, to meditate on the floor, and you know, all these kind of basic things that to me are like, you know, spirituality 101, but they, they were incredible at the time. So information, um, stopping resisting the process because what I eventually realized was that what was happening was that my body was releasing trauma. The issue wasn't Kundalini, the issue wasn't consciousness, it wasn't even the shaking or going into weird body positions. It was what was coming up, which was essentially trauma, emotions I hadn't felt safe or ready to express. Um, and then eventually things like ancestors and past life trauma and, and that sort of stuff. And so I learned by tending to what was coming up, I felt not only a sense of control, but also um, a sense of being an assistant in my own process. And so I wrote my book, The Body Deva, um, to share with people who are going under any type of spiritual awakening, but particularly Kundalini awakenings. Um, I mean, the book can be good for anybody that wants to get to know their body and what it has to say on, on any sort of level. But I learned very much through my bodywork education, um, as well as my own education, things like to surrender and to work with whatever is coming up. Um, because if you work with whatever is coming up for you, what happens is that you're kind of working in concert with Kundalini. And so it will clear and release. And over time, what happens is that things become lighter and you're no longer living in the same patterns that you once were. You no longer have the same identity that you once did. Um, and so I began to see the fruits of my labor, so to speak, um, and I also realized that this was a process that wasn't, I wasn't in some great battle against or anything like that. It really was bringing me to a place of peace and joy um, that I really never thought that I could experience. You used the word surrender there. And I think sometimes that can have a connotation of passivity uh, or checking out and uh, not necessarily, of course. And But you're also talking about this active cooperation with the process uh, which which implies that active role so i'm curious um if you could say a little bit more about surrender and um perhaps uh clarify how you see it is it is it a passivity is it is it a kind of uh, letting go is it an acceptance how would you uh expand on the word surrender you know it can be it can be a passive process for example sitting in silent meditation allowing for thoughts to come up with breath that is an incredible way of surrendering. Um, but I find surrendering to be a very active process, um, a very body-led process. And so um, being of service, um, looking inwards towards my intuition and getting a sense of what I should be doing with myself, even waking up and, you know, um, getting a sense of what I should be doing with my day. Um, those are all methods of surrender on the, on the surface that doesn't really sound like it. But when you are able to connect to intuition and that sense of um, divinity within that sort of small, quiet voice that's within, what will happen um, is this sense of knowing of what you should be doing with yourself and allowing yourself to not let your own um, your own thoughts for yourself, your own biases, your own theology and dogmas and all of that sort of stuff to get in the way of that process um, is really what the surrender is. It's kind of clearing off all of those beliefs and all of those thoughts and all of those ideas of what your life should look like 
to surrender to something that is likely far greater than that or, or simply different than, you know, what you would think of for yourself. You've written, most of the information regarding Kundalini is like a bad game of telephone, the child's game where one person has information and passes it to the next person, and so on down the line, until at the end the message has lost all meaning. I'm wondering off the, t off the top of your head, what are some of the common misconceptions you see out there about Kundalini? I think that specifically in the West and in Western spirituality, we have this desire to be at the top of the mountain immediately. And so there is this tendency to gravitate towards words that we equate with great spiritual value to want to claim them for ourselves. Um, and the interesting thing is, is that, you know, um, for example, it took me 10 years to accept that I was even going through a Kundalini awakening or, or um, would mention it to other people, but that desire to label yourself as, as that sort of disappears. But kind of back to the, to the topic at hand is that with spirituality, there is this desire for this competitiveness, this desire to be at the finish line, um, to announce oneself as have it, having had a Kundalini awakening, being enlightened, all of that sort of competitive material spirituality stuff that um, we're all probably pretty familiar with. Um, there's also a misunderstanding of the word because a lot of the resources um, have been translated, so there can be issues with translation. And a lot of the resources um, can be very intellectual without direct experience. And so there definitely is a place for intellectualization. There's a place for academia. Um, but what has happened is that if you don't have direct experience of Kundalini awakening, it's kind of hard to describe something. I kind of, I liken it to, you could read as many manuals as you want about how to fly a plane, but if you've never flown a plane before, there's only so much you can understand about what it feels like to actually be a pilot, you know, and actually know how to fly a plane. Um, so that's kind of where the bad game of telephone comes in, is, is a mixture, um, mixture of those things. Overall, I would say, though, is that um, there are a bunch of different types of spiritual awakening, and um, the word kundalini has become um, kind of a catch-all word for every type of spiritual awakening, um, when really there are different kinds. Um, and I wrote my first book, The Spiritual Awakening Guide, to delineate that, or at least give a, give a map for that, um, because they have different needs, um, whether you awaken from the crown chakra, or whether you start with kundalini in the, in the root and second chakra. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my long answer to that. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, I'd like to ask you about um, maybe a little bit more, if you don't mind, about Kundalini and move on to some of some of your other themes. What triggered, do you think, this Kundalini experience at 23? You've talked about some of the, if you want, preconditions for Kundalini and um, sensitivity, actually, in general, um, such as childhood trauma, actually, uh, and uh, lineage of uh, sensitive people, et cetera, in the family, psychics, I suppose, in the family and so on. Past lives also you've mentioned. I'm curious, what do you think triggered this at 23? I expect you have some insight on that. And how likely is Kundalini to just occur to somebody? And does that happen? Are there practices that bring it about? So say somebody wanted to activate their Kundalini or engage in this sort of process, how would they go about it? So it's a sort of range of questions really about how Kundalini starts either unintentionally or intentionally and specifically in your case. Yeah, the, I'll see if I can answer all of those in one. Um, I would love to be able to give you a succinct answer about why Kundalini, why I had a Kundalini awakening. And the answer is that I don't fully know. I know that there are, a whole host of what we might call karmic or ancestral or personal reasons why it potentiated the process possibly, but um, 
I can feel confident in saying that I don't fully know why I'm, you know, <laughs> why that happened at 23 and why, um, and why all that has happened in my life has happened. I know that it has led me to a path where um, I am able to be of service utilizing my sensitivities, um, which um, was very important for me. Um, but the simple answer is, is that I don't know. And I encounter people every day because I do spiritual work for a living. And um, some people can do yoga for 20 years or have a complete lineage of yogis in their family and never have Kundalini awakening um, happen. And another person can go to one yoga class or one Reiki class and have it occur um, either temporarily or permanently. And so, there is a lot in terms of awakening um, that has to do with destiny and larger forces that we can only see so we can only see so much of. And I do think that some of the most profound words that we can say are "I don't know." Um, so that's my answer to the first part of the question. Um, and I think I answered the second, which is that. Um, people definitely do have spontaneous kundalini awakenings. Typically they are temporary stirrings of it. Um, for example, I was very involved with craniosacral therapy, which is a form of body work for a long time. And people would have stirrings of kundalini awakening um, where they would literally be you know, glowing and have energy flowing through, through their body and going into yoga positions and, and stuff like that on, on the table. Um, and then things would kind of die back down again. And so, um, so I would say that people who have a deep yearning for truth or some reason to look deeper at reality are typically the people who find it. Um, and this group of individuals are typically people who have a reason or a need to look deeper at reality because they either sense that something is off with reality or something traumatic has happened to them that has caused for them to start a questioning process in regards to the world and the people in it. Um, and so those are kind of my two um, answers as to the types of people that tend to have kundalini awakenings or people who are looking for larger things or people who are looking for answers because their sense of safety, their sense of self, their sense of the world being a good, healthy place um, was never established for them. Um, so I'm kind of forgetting your last question, but I, I, I believe it was can you remember your last question? Well, I think you've you've covered it actually quite well, which was okay. how would one, if one wanted to, you know, you've talked about Kundalini as a sort of symptom of searching or for ver and the various reasons that one might be looking for answers or, or looking for, you know, more or searching for truth, actually, as you've, as you've described a period of your life is very much to do with searching for truth. And you contrast that with a later orientation towards peace, which we'll come to, I think. But um, also, I mean, presumably there are some people who just, want to awaken their kundalini for, I don't know, if the fun of it, for the thrill of it, uh, for the experiential, um, you know, you're talking about Clive Barker, that's a theme in his work anyway, isn't it? So do you see people who are seeking to awaken their kundalini for various reasons? They're seeking it as a sort of end goal, as opposed to a consequence of a greater search. You know, I don't tend to I, I used to earlier in my career run into people who were more interested in, you know, opening psychic abilities or developing, you know, uh, Kundalini and, and that sort of stuff. And there are very direct paths to opening Kundalini. Spinal breathing, for example, is one. Um, I think that I, I'm kind of partial because I started there, but um, Zen Buddhism um, is a is a great way. Um, not for that specific goal, but for spiritual awakening in general, that ability to be able to work with the mind and to understand that you are not your thoughts and to just be in a space where we are such a culture of doing, going to a state of being is, um, is so incredible. Um, I think that personal healing is um, 
definitely paramount for people who want to awaken Kundalini because if we talk about what is in the way of us recognizing ourselves as consciousness or recognizing ourselves as consciousness experiencing itself, it is the trauma and beliefs and, and that sort of stuff that are covering it up. Um, and so anyone willing to do any form of mind body or mind body spirit work, whatever that looks like for them, um, is definitely a step in the right direction. But if we're talking about extremely direct paths, um, spinal breathing would be the one I would say. However, I'd say it with caveats, which is that I suggest people find a teacher. Um, otherwise, it is easy for people to um, experience a shamanic journey where they see something shiny or to experience a stirring of kundalini um, and to think that they have a fully awakened kundalini. Um, and so there really is a, a teacher necessary a lot of times to offer guideposts and wisdom and, and encouragement. You've written that uh, about the traps of kundalini and one of them is as you point out here mistaking the first step of the path for the for the last step of the path or for, you know the, the completion of the path other than missing out on the rest of the process are there any negative consequences for somebody who might mistakenly believe a stirring or seeing something shiny as you as you say um is it uh is there are there any negative uh, consequences there for, for a person in that situation other than just missing out on what what else could be done well i wouldn't exactly call it missing out for them because there is a recognition that I gained at a certain point where I realized that those people are perfect exactly where they are, that we look for, we find exactly what we're looking for. Um, and so for some people that might be dipping, you know, kind of their toes in the ocean for other people, it might be, you know, fully being at the bottom of the ocean. Um, and so what I realized over time is that that person taking one step and experiencing a little bit of kundalini stirring for them, that might be enough for them this lifetime. Um, and so I will say that um, in terms of spirituality, there is a large difference between, as I mentioned, intellectual um, pursuit and embodied pursuit, direct experience pursuit. And there is also the um, recognition of uh, spiritually uh, spirituality as aesthetic rather than something truly known and truly needed and truly searched for. If you're looking for spirituality as an identity, something to mark you as other or different or to bypass trauma. Um, that is going to be something where, yeah, it's easy to uh, say I have a Kundalini awakening, maybe take a step, maybe take no steps, maybe take st several steps. Um, but it takes a great deal of surrender and a fair amount of sacrifice to, um, to walk a spiritual path of, of any depth. And it isn't the right choice for everyone. When you use that word sacrifice, I wonder what what what's in your mind as you as you use that word? The word sacrifice. Um, well, I had to work through a lot of martyr syndrome. <laughs> but uh, what I would say is that it takes time. It takes devotion. It takes a willingness to look at yourself, how you operate, um, how you react to people, how you interact with people. Um, there's this Ram Das quote that I love that, um, that is, I'm going to butcher it, but it's something like, if you think you're enlightened, go spend a weekend with your family. <laughs> you know, and I've always loved that quote because with our interactions with, our, with the world and with ourselves and with one another, we really can see the areas in which we're stuck, in which areas of our lives aren't working, in which our beliefs and thoughts about ourselves or about others um, what emotions are getting in the way. And it takes a lot of courage and it takes a lot of willingness to be um, able and willing to look at what isn't working in our lives, what is sort of getting in the way. Um, and it does require a fair amount of sacrifice and that sacrifice is time, that sacrifice is 
um, energy, that sacrifice is um, eventually living a life that is in some ways quite similar to people around you, but in other ways can be quite vastly different um, to the people around you. It's funny you said you had to uh, work through a lot of martyr syndrome. So one of, part, one of the sacrifices is you couldn't be a martyr anymore. <laughs> is that what you're saying? Yes, actually, I had to sacrifice my martyrhood. I had to, uh, there were a lot of things that were interesting that sort of fell away. I went through a period in 2019 um, where all of a sudden everything sort of dropped away. I was no longer interested. A big part of my identity had been reading and it has been from an early age. Um, everything I could get my hands on in terms of mysticism, occultism, you know, um, spirituality, and all of a sudden I wasn't interested in reading anymore, and dropping away of stuff like that from your identity can not only be confusing for periods of time, because you kind of are like, I wonder what's going on, but um, allowing for that to, to occur uh, can be a bit of sacrifice because um, now I'm in a place where I'm very happy with all I've learned, but you know, I went through four years of Chinese medicine school and out of that, I became a spiritual <laughs> teacher. You know, um, those degrees and certifications at a certain point, um, I recognize that those things need to define me in the outer world in terms of getting things like book published or doing interviews and stuff like that but personally for me there were things that needed to drop away in terms of my identification because I was using them in some small or large way to prove myself to the outer world to say here I am I am worthy I'm good enough I am superior and if you're willing to look at all of that sort of stuff you can take back so much energy you have put out into the world and and take it back and realize that you are worthy as you are you are perfect as you are you are good enough as you are and as that process happens what happens is that this need to prove yourself or show yourself to the outer world stops um, and it's an interesting thing to have happen because aspects of your identity that you really thought were fixed, that you really thought were a part of you, can either come from wounding or they can simply, um, you can simply change and shift interests in a way um, that can be um, pleasant, it could be jarring, it could be just kind of, you know, mind boggling, I guess I would say. <laughs> Very interesting. You've written also that for, gosh, now, 15 years, from 2004 to 2019, you were a ritual magician and drawn to, also to energy work and shamanism. Of course, you've written, recently published your third book um, on shamanism. Uh, I'm curious about the ritual magic. Was that a particular, uh, I suppose, system of ritual magic that you were involved in? Were you, was it a communal? Uh, situation or a solo pursuit. Could you say a little about your ritual magic practice? Um, it was very much a solo pursuit. Um, ever since I was a child, I was interested in occultism and varying um, aspects of it because it was so other. Um, it was so intriguing to me that here were people who talked and spoke about reality in such a different way than, you know, my parents did or people, you know, in the Midwest that surrounded me did. Um, and so in terms of ritual magic, um, I did a fair amount of Western ceremonial magic, um, but my focus was on the Greek magical papyri, which is um, magic that doesn't come magic that still kind of goes through the, the European tradition, which most Western ceremonial magic does. Um, but uh, um, how do I describe this? But has flavors of what goes beyond that or underneath that. It, it was a system and a book that really, and a practice that really connected with me and 
I am somebody, the reason that I so connected to it at the time was first of all, I started making friends with a fair amount of people or getting clients who um, were interested or who got in trouble with varying aspects of um, ceremonies and rituals and, and that sort of stuff. Um, but also there was a fascination for me because what magic and ritual work does is that it both offers a really good map of the mechanics of energy work. Um, and it also provides a way directly to shift your reality through ritual. So um, that was a lot of my focus in terms of ritual. And um, it went from kind of Greek magical papyri to more focused on shamanic ritual, um, which in, involves the elements for me um, and doing uh, ritual that way. Very interesting. I think many people will perhaps be at least superficially familiar with um, ritual magic uh, as it's perhaps depicted in movies, or maybe know a bit more thinking of perhaps Crowley or OTO, or maybe uh, someone's run across Poke Runyon or something like this, you know? So I'm, I'm curious um, if you could uh, give us a sense of how that Greek tradition, the workings in that Greek tradition might differ from some of the other uh, Western magic, um, tre uh, uh, I suppose, I, want, I don't want to say lineage. What, what should I say, really? West, Western magic styles. Could I say that? Genres. Yeah, styles or orders or, you know, whatever you want to use. Um, the first thing is that, you know, uh, there's a quote attributed to Groucho Marx that people aren't sure if he actually said it, but um, I, I wouldn't be a part of a club that would have me as a member. <laughs> and so that has, uh, I wouldn't be a part of any club that would have me as a member. What I found was that um, a lot of Western occultism is still suffers from a great deal of misogyny. And I find that that is changing, but I had no interest in joining kind of a, a boys club, so to speak, um, especially when I did study things like Crawley and do, um, you know, rituals, bornless rite, and, you know, all of these rituals that are well known and are kind of, you know, the markers of, okay, you're a magician of this caliber, you've done rituals of this caliber, you know, I've kind of checked off those boxes. What I found was that um, I very much resonate with the with what could be conveniently called the the dark feminine and that current that way of being was simply not a part of the western occult world unless it was something that was um thought of or utilized as a by a male um and so i did do a great deal of study and learned a, a great deal um, but what happened was that I started realizing that there is more to ritual magic than, you know, the OTO or, you know, similar organizations, Golden Dawn and similar organizations like that. And I realized that I didn't really resonate with them. And so I kind of went from, I should be doing these sort of things to working with, um, going deeper and deeper into academic work, specifically Stephen Skinner's work, who is amazing, and um, Jake Stratton Kent's work, um, both of who work with very dark subjects, um, but their work very much led me to the Greek, um, to the Greek work and to work that is more scholarly and academic, but it all that work also included um, hymns and all the stuff that I remember from Greek myth as a kid and it just hit me in a particular place and more importantly it worked for me in a way that the stuff that from the Golden Dawn, Dawn and Crowley and all that sort of stuff didn't really um, work for me in the same way. Mm. Does that make sense? Yes certainly it does. Very, it's very interesting. What do you mean by worked for you in this case? If you are doing a ritual what you are looking for is a specific outcome. You are looking to shift reality in accordance to um, what you're hoping to manifest, what you are hoping to have happen, whether it is work for yourself or work for other people. In some way, you're looking to shift your 
reality. And so ritual is really a way to um, put that desire out there um, and the um, putting that out there and saying, you know, essentially, hey, universe, or, you know, hey, whoever, whomever you're speaking to, um, hey, divine, um, this is my plea, this is what I'd like to manifest, this is what I'd like to have occur. Um, that is a very powerful thing when there is a lot of intention set, when there's clarity set, when there is energy built in your system. And so what happens is that you essentially create a petition um, and put it out there and sort of wait to see how things in your life will change and shift. And it's similar to spiritual awakening in some ways, because what happens as a result of doing um, ritual work is that um, things in your life do change and what is work not working in your life very clearly shows itself. Could you say a little more about that last point? That's very interesting. I find during the spiritual awakening process that what comes up is the patterns, I call them loops, but they're really kind of the repeated behaviors, um, repeated patterns of our existence. Um, we know what isn't working in our lives and what consciousness of these patterns can do is to make them irritating enough <laughs> that we become aware of them and that we can change them. So, um, you know, you can see very clearly what isn't working in your life by looking at what keeps on repeating in your life, basically. Hmm. Very interesting. I wonder if I might ask a muggle question. Oh, sure. <laughs> you know, you're talking there about ritual and you're using really a quite classic, I think, definition there of attempting to bring out some sort of change in reality in accordance to, you know, what your what your aim is and or your will, as they might say, for instance. But um, I'm more, I, I'm curious what sort of things ritual magicians want. It seems one would eventually sort of run out of things that one would want, um, perhaps not. And I wonder if there are more or less efficient ways of getting some of the things that one wants. I mean, you know, one thinks of the song, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? You know, that sort of thing. My friends all have, what is it? Porsches yeah. and Benz. Like that. It's like, you know, is that what we're talking about here? I mean, I'd like a new car or I'd like a new job or, um, is it something of the long way around to do that through a ritual to Hecate or whoever the case may be? So there I'm asking as an outsider, as a muggle, really, what sort of things are commonly sought in rituals? I suppose that's the thing I'm saying. And then the other thing is that presumably there are various degrees of potency uh, that practitioners have. And presumably that also limits the extent to which they can shift reality in accord with their rituals. Um, do you think, is it possible that there are magicians of a great potency, strong potency, who are able to affect, say, um, world events or uh, cultural shifts, or, uh, et cetera, et cetera? Is that sort of thing said to be occurring within the ritual magic community? Are, are, are there, is there, is there that sort of thing going on? So there's a, a sort of a few questions, I suppose, there about ritual as uh, affecting reality? Well, I do think that people like to claim things <laughs> quite a bit. <laughs> um, and so there is that le level of things of, you know, people going on, you know, uh, TikTok or, or whatever. Um, and, but underneath that, there are sort of levels of ritual, you know, and sometimes people re re will refer to it as low and high magic, but that sort of delineation is separating um, a bit. But essentially, there are rituals that are meant for what would be considered low magic, but really it's daily existence. It's getting that car payment. It is getting your mortgage or rent paid on time. It is getting, you know, getting back at your boss. 
for being a jerk, you know, all that sort of stuff is included in kind of what would be considered low magic. In terms of high magic, it tends to be more academic, but within that high magic um, and even some of the low magic, there can be people of power. Um, and that's actually part of my shamanic workbook three book is cultivating power who for whatever reasons, whether it be that they've worked on themselves personally and they've done a great deal of magic or they have reason, there's typically, you know, a reason why people become interested in um, particular rituals or particular, why somebody might be interested in occultism and another person might be interested in Kabbalah and another person might be interested in, you know, Sunday night football, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, but the short answer is yes, there are people that can change the weather. There are people who are employed by celebrities, um, by all sorts of politicians and, and people who are spiritual workers who work as advisors or who work um, their best to change and shift reality. Um, and, but any good ritual magician will know that there are much greater forces out there. And so figuring out how to work with those rather than attempting to be one singular person, um, trying to force things to happen is really kind of the secret of doing any of this type of, any of this type of work. Um, does that make sense? Mm, yeah. Yeah. Okay. People, there's a subset of people interested in magic who actually are teenagers, and that could be a wonderful time to explore reality. But also, as teenagers or people stuck in a teenager mindset, we tend to get grandiose ideas of reality as well. And so, people claiming to, you know, bring down a politician or to change the moon or, or stuff like that. Um, they typically don't recognize that that politician or that institution likely has a lot of spiritual protection and one person or even one group isn't going to change or change or shift that and also the people who are out there sort of claiming you know i'm the greatest ever you know uh, uh there's typically a reason why they need to claim that in themselves um and that would be helpful <laughs> for them to look at it at some point <laughs> when you say a politician or so or an institution would have a lot of spiritual protection do you mean that's act they're actively recruiting that or it's it's the sort of spiritual protection of 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 the of the authority vested in the institution by the minds of the people who are aware of it etc is it a sort of passive or active spiritual protection i'm curious what you mean by that part it is both. It's an institutional protection. If you have an institution that has a great deal of power naturally because they have a lot of resources, money, you know, know-how, titles, that sort of stuff, that is one layer of things. And it's also, um, you know, you could look at the entire History Channel for this, but um, buildings are built in specific ways. They have specific statues, specific symbols, um, and they have uh, often hired particular people essentially in the role of shaman or whatever they're, they're going to define that role as to um, offer protection as well as guidance. So um, I know of plenty of people who in the spiritual field who have worked with what would be um, considered famous people either for guidance or for some sort of ritual work or, or, or protection. Um, and I have worked with famous people, but I never know who they are. <laughs> but, uh, but what I would say is that it's, it's not uncommon and it's easy to get into a sort of conspiracy sort of thing, but it simply is a, uh, um, kind of going back to the thought of, you know, um, people in the stock market utilizing astrologers, you know, spiritual guidance isn't a new thing. Spiritual protection isn't a new thing, um, especially for people in power. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. You know, we're coming, I think, near the end of our time today, Mary, but it's been so fascinating. I wonder if I might ask you a bit about your near-death experience and the shift from truth to peace. In 2008, you had a near-death experience, which 
left you unable to read, for example, or process very much for about a year. You've said that. I'm curious what happened there and what were the consequences of that? And what about this shift from truth to peace that occurred in the years following? Yeah, so I had a near-death experience in which I was hospitalized and I actually needed to get back to my life pretty quickly. I was in my last year of graduate school and my graduate school was basically like, oh, I'm sorry to hear you're sick, but if you miss any more courses, you know, you have to repeat the, the trimester. So I went back to school. And so that whole year, um, I would list it as a type of ego death. And for me, I realize other people have slightly different definitions of this, but it was a period of where so much material was coming up for me and was releasing from my system that I really couldn't focus on anything else. Earlier, you mentioned, you know, periods going where, um, where my diet needed to drastically change. And, and that's because there was so much energy going through my system and my system was so busy that the thought of food and actually digesting the food was too difficult for my system because it was kind of rerouting and, and you know, <laughs> sort of uh, uh, going through all sorts of uh, experiences. Um, and so that experience was such a large experience that it took me a long time to unpack. But one of the things that it did was that it showed me that I always had this quest for truth. And part of it was rooted in the fact that as a kid, I always noticed that what people were saying and what they meant um, were two different things and it really bothered me. And so this quest for truth was really rooted in, in a sort of child self as well as kind of a spiritual sense um, that was quite healthy. But when I dropped that sort of need to prove myself right, when that sort of dropped for me, you know, uh, need to prove myself as valid, as inherently worthy, as inherently lovable, all of those sorts of things that started to come into my life at that point, what happened was that I started to experience periods of stillness. I would experience instead of shaking static poses um, and periods of peace and stillness. And I recognize that as a baseline state and a state that um, was kind of the next stage of my evolution. Very interesting indeed. You've written about the importance of, which I was surprised to read actually, you talked about the importance of connecting with incorporeal uh, spiritual teachers. And I'm really curious about that. Um, I'm curious what you mean by that actually, and how one goes about connecting to a non-corporeal, by that of course I mean sort of not in the body, right? Um, spiritual teacher. And about entities in general, actually, how, how you uh, relate to that area and your own experience of, of, of these sorts of realms. What I teach my students is to treat the spirit realms as a mirror to our reality. And so that means that there are some spirits that would want to, you know, um, mug you and take your wallet and there are some spirits that can you know be great sources of, of wisdom um, or of information or be a particular teacher to you for a particular thing um, and so one of the things that I very much unpack with my students is often there is such a fear of the spirit realms um, and I find that that, I'm gonna kind of go off on a slight tangent, but I find that very much has to do with um, our fear of nature, our fear of our own nature, our fear of our own bodies. Um, people tend to energetically live kind of from the neck up. And so this idea of feeling, knowing states, intuitive states, connecting to intuition, um, that really opens people up to, to the spirit realms and to all that it offers, including guidance and wisdom from 
um, not only what we might call, you know, um, entities, that's kind of a loaded word, but um, also from flows of inspiration and things that cannot be easily, you know, defined or, or seen, they're, they're simply felt. Does that answer your question? Mm. Yes, yeah, certainly. And are, are there certain practices that one does to connect with these um, non-corporeal teachers? Um, for example, I have had people, I have interviewed people on the podcast who've talked about channeling or having contact with uh, deities of various kinds, uh, to, uh, White Tara or something, or uh, Padmasambhava, <laughs> and taking dictation from them or having dreams of ongoing dream-based you know, relationship or trance encounters with these, or I, I've heard that, of course, and the traditions that we're sort of referencing. Of course, it's rarely, I think, emphasized in popular modern teaching of these traditions, but certainly many of the texts and scriptures that are used are often received from some deity. I mean, some people think it's myth or whatever, but oh, I got this from the sea serpents. Nagarjuna says, right? Or oh, Manjushri came and gave me this text, you know, et cetera, et cetera. People say that. And even today, actually, in certain lineages, that's still said to occur. So, yeah, I'm curious if there, um, if there are means of connecting with these sorts of, uh, uh, these sorts of non-corporeal teachers in particular. There are. Um, I will say, in my case, I was lucky in that um, I had them come to me and but even when I have had specific spiritual teachers it's not like they come up to you and say hi my name is Steve let me give you the keys of the universe spiritual relationships are like any type of relationship in which kind of depth and intimacy happens over time but if you look at inspiration kind of going back to poetry and artists and dancers they are deeply in contact with the other, with the spirit realms. Um, and some of them may know it and some of them may not. Um, it's sense that that connection. Um, and so, yes, I have worked with people who, um, and even in my own painting practice, where I will feel a specific type of flow or merging. Um, in my work, we do merging or voluntary possession practices where an energy can come through you for healing purposes or to create a painting or something like that. Um, in the modern world, we tend to um, shy away from that, from any sort of um, spirit contact um, for a lot of complicated reasons I won't get into, but a lot of it has to do with our separation from nature. My simple answer is going to be that if somebody wishes to connect with spirits, I always suggest that they connect with their ancestors first, healthy ancestors. I teach how to do so in my shamanic workbook. One, I believe, because these are spirits that actually have, um, are typically more than willing to speak and have a vested interest in you um, and, um, and are typically already, already around. So um, that is where I gear people who are looking who are looking to make spirit contact. Hmm. Oh, very interesting. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to ask you just in a moment how people can contact you to work with you. Uh, but um, two one-line questions, if you'll permit them. Sure. Okay. Over the years, I've learned that it's quite common for people at about the 10-year mark of daily meditation to begin to have encounters with extraterrestrials. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah bringing out all the all the yeah the one-liners in the books um i will say at a certain point of daily meditation um things start to get really weird and your concept of reality starts shifting in such a way that you become open to the forces that are around you and aware that there is so much around you that you simply didn't notice before um and so I noticed that at the around the 10 year mark is when people tend to make that shift um, into having gone through enough of their own stuff to actually be able to see and sense larger and, you know, kind of um, more out there forces, so to speak. 
And is that specific to a particular type of meditation? Do you see that often people doing this type, for example, uh, are ending up there? Or do you think it can happen in any meditation practice? I think that anyone who is sincerely devoted in their meditation practice, um, I have seen it kind of across the spectrum. I specifically do not have or kind of correlate myself with a specific path. Um, and so I see people from a lot of different paths. And so I will say that a lot of paths, if the person is sincere and devoted and is able to go past those kind of ego barriers where they think that they're much farther than they actually are, they're willing to rein themselves back in and be like, oh, okay, what else do I have to work with? Um, that, um, yes, I have seen it with um, plenty of people, sincere, devoted people of all paths is that that devotion eventually leads to um to that sort of weirdness i would guess mm -hmm. <laughs> i guess i would say <laughs> yeah okay then my last one-liner question is i noticed in the uh resources section of your book working with kundalini uh, you listed the knee of listening by um later uh, franklin jones later known as adi Dam. i'm curious uh why and what What's your um, what's your take? Of course, Knee of Listening at the time was an enormously influential book, actually, when it was published, uh, widely read. Um, so I'm curious, what's your take on Adi Da and, and uh, the Knee of Listening and so on? At the point that I found Knee of Listening, I had read so many spiritual autobiographies, and I would say that some of them didn't seem true to me at all. Some of them felt fairly true. His Knee of Listening was the first one that I read that really struck that truth chord for me. It was like probably at like 97%, which for me is like, it's pretty much as high as you can go. It really struck me in um, his work as well as I read John Lilly's right after. And both of them are problematic figures in their own way. Um, and even though they experienced extraordinary states of consciousness. John Lilly was um, worked with dolphins a bit. He was the inventor of the float tank. Um, in terms of Adida, um, I think that his is a good tale to talk about because he was somebody who was incredibly conscious, but yet he still succumbed to, you know, the typical, um, kind of power story, internal power struggle, um, where eventually he utilized that power in ways that were victimized others. Um, so I do recommend it because I do think that it is essential reading and it is one of the most truthful spiritual autobiographies I've read. And I do consider him to be a man of great consciousness. I also consider him to be quite problematic. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Well, Mary, thank you very much for such a fascinating uh, in, uh, interview. Um, whereabouts can people find you? MaryShutan.com um, is the site, of course. Uh, what sort of things are you up to? How can people work with you if, they're, if they feel like they'd like to do that? Um, I do, yeah, so visit MaryShutan.com. Uh, and they're paid for books and you know you can find my books on amazon and other resources um and i do one-on-one -on -one healing work um, and so if you go to my website you'll find blog information about sessions as well as um, information about my teaching um, courses and course schedule and all of that well mary shutan thank you very much great to be here Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.